Well, we are in store for an extraordinary treat, I think unlike anything I have ever seen before. I've been to a lot of colloquium and symposiums and forums <coughs> discussing court cases and their significance. I've never been to one where the author of the plurality opinion of that decision could speak with us about his ruling, nor the architect, the intellectual architect of the litigation that led to it, nor New York's preeminent commentator of our state's highest court, the Court of Appeals. Uh, this is going to be remarkable. To my immediate right, and I just sort of note these are folks who don't need an introduction, and for those of you who want to see a more extended biography, it's in the materials, but just very quickly. To my immediate right is none other than the great former judge of the New York Court of Appeals, Robert Smith, just as he was a lawyer's lawyer, many years of distinguished practice as a litigator at the Paul Weiss firm. He was a judge's judge renowned for his acuity, sharp questions, and breadth of intellect. To his immediate right is Jim McGuire, Judge Jim McGuire, formerly a justice of the New York State Supreme Court, an distinguished appellate division justice in the first department. He was before that counsel to Governor Pataki, I think I'm not speaking out of school. It's been published that Jim really was the intellectual mind that sort of fashioned much of that litigation, hoping to see a particular result come in the Court of Appeals. It'll be interesting to see how pleased or not he was with the final product. And to Judge Murray. Very. Very? <laughs> and to his immediate right, uh, uh, no stranger to those of you at Albany Law School, Professor Vince Bonaventura, uh, I think all of us know who read papers of record in the capital region and around the state and watch television, Professor Bonaventura is the leading commentator on the Court of Appeals, probably its finest student in the modern era. So without further ado, Judge Smith, will you share with us your thoughts about how you ruled? Thank you, and uh, my thanks to the Rockefeller Institute and everyone else who's uh, given me the opportunity to participate in this program. Uh, I guess when I thought back on um, uh, this case, the thing that, uh, that struck me most about it was that it turned out to be an easier case than I thought it was. That may, not, may, may seem surprising, but when I first got acquainted with the idea and, and began to think about the problem that the case presented, I thought that I was uh, going to have to struggle with a really very, very fundamental problem of government, which is the extent to which you can leverage the power of the purse. It's the power of the purse, the power to appropriate money, or not to appropriate money, is, uh, can be enormous, can uh, 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 have tremendous influence, and that's not exactly a new discovery. It, it dates back quite a way. Uh, at least to 1846. Who knows what I'm thinking of when I say 1846? Ah, the Wilmot Proviso. The, um, in 1846, uh, Congress wanted, uh, had the, the, the Mexican War had just ended. There were new territories that had to, been, uh, had to be organized, and Congress was going to appropriate the enormous sum of $2 million uh, for that task. Uh, and a congressman named David Wilmot uh, added to the uh, appropriation bill a proviso, so provided that in the new territories acquired from Mexico, there shall never be slavery. Uh, a, uh, it, it didn't, a, as, as you may know, that's not exactly how slavery got abolished, but it was a, a tremendously important attempt uh, to do that, and a classic example of how uh, purely budgetary power can be used for a, um, an overriding uh, social uh, purpose, and it's happened again and again, or at least people try to do it. They try more often than they succeed, but there were serious efforts to end the Vietnam War through the power of the purse, and I guess ultimately, maybe in 1975, that's how it was ended. Uh, uh, Speaker Gingrich in the 1990s tried to use the power of the purse, not with total success, uh, but it's been happen it's happened again and again, and um, for me, the, the question that originally occurred to me when I began to study the, um, uh, the uh, Pataki v. New York State Assembly case was what, um, uh, uh, whether the, the, uh, the 
New York system of executive budgeting had essentially reversed the power, had given the power of the purse to the governor, and would allow the governor to leverage the power of the purse uh, into essentially, if not coercing, certainly strongly pressuring the legislature into doing what he wanted in things that were not really budgetary. Um, I eventually came to the conclusion that while it's a fascinating question how much the, 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 the uh, Constitution does that and how much the governor could get away with, that that question was never, was not presented in the case I had before me because that really wasn't uh, what the governor was doing. Uh, the governor wasn't doing anything so outrageous at all, or uh, maybe outrageous isn't the word, or it wasn't doing anything so sweeping at all as all that. I think to appreciate that, I want to tell you that I think there are a lot of false, false distinctions or false, uh, false oppositions that are set up when you talk about the, um, uh, the problem presented. Uh, by this case. People say, well, how much can you have, a, well, yeah, how do you distinguish between appropriation and legislation? Or how do you distinguish between budgetary and substantive legislation? Or how do you distinguish between budgetary uh, legislation and policy making? Well, the short answer is you don't. There is no distinction. Every budget is, of course, a policy decision. Every budget is substantive. Every budget is legislation. Or as Governor Patterson put it, every button budget is the making of choices and the setting of priorities. There's really nothing more substantive that, uh, that, the governor, the, that you can do. And every decision about how to spend money is a policy-making decision. And it, yeah, to, to, to try to, say, to draw a line between what is budgetary and what is policy-making and what is legislative is really a hopeless task. Uh, you, 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 yeah, not only is it a hard line to draw, the line just isn't there. Uh, that I, I wrote that in, uh, in, in, in the opinion, and I still believe it. So that when um, uh, uh, Governor Pataki uh, wrote in to his budget in, uh, I guess this, was in, this one was in 2001, uh, how the, uh, a, a very elaborate formula for the giving of state aid to school districts uh, in the state, to me there was nothing at all in there that overstepped the bounds of proper budgeting. I mean, what's, what's more budgetary than deciding this district gets this many dollars, this one gets this money, this one that gets this money? That's a budget. That's what a budget does. So why did everyone have hysterics? Partly because he did it more aggressively uh, and, in a, uh, and in a way that had never been done before. Uh, in fact, I think we also said in the opinion, look, if he'd just done it, if he just listed all the school districts and put dollars next to their names, no one could have complained. Instead, he did it in a way that had been traditionally done by legislation. He wrote, God knows how many pages was it, Jim? 17, 17 pages of, uh, uh, of here's, a, here, here's how you figure out which school district gets which, uh, which money. And that had always been done before in non-budgetary legislation. It was a major change politically, but I was convinced it was not a change in principle. And I was also convinced that it, it, it did not make sense to try to hold the governor to what had historically been thought of as budgetary. That's a changing line. You can never really pin it down. So basically, I came to the conclusion that was a nice, easy case and that, uh, and that everything uh, the governor did uh, was just fine. I, um, I, I failed to persuade everyone uh, <laughs> that the case was, was quite as easy uh, as, um, as I thought it was, but it was easier to me than the case I thought I might have got and the case that I think uh, really deserves to be, uh, to be thought about. Um, suppose, um, suppose the governor had uh, wanted, had, uh, pr had said not uh, um, this, you yeah, uh, we give aid to education on the following 17 pages of conditions, but that we fund the county clerk's office uh, in this state on, on one simple condition, that no county clerk's office shall, and you can fill in the blank, shall refuse or shall issue a license to a same-sex couple, a marriage license to a same-sex couple. Uh, that's, uh, I suppose that's yesterday's controversy, but that would have been a pretty hot topic uh, back in, um, in 2004, and I think uh, to, even today some people can get themselves agitated about it. Uh, would that have been uh, permissible under the Constitution? Could the governor essentially have 
created or prevented same-sex marriage in New York through a budgetary measure? Is that what Henry Stimson was, allow uh, uh, was allowing the, um, the governor to do? The, um, you know, if you don't, you don't, you don't like, uh, uh, I, I didn't put that particular example in the opinion. I was tempted, but, but uh, wiser, uh, well, yeah, wiser minds than mine suggested that, uh, made the obvious suggestion of that one in the opinion. Nobody would ever read anything else in the opinion or talk about anything else in the opinion. Uh, but that, uh, that to me epitomizes the problem, or if you don't like, say, if you don't like the same-sex marriage example, try drug legalization, guns, anything you want. Uh, is, 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 can the governor leverage the power he's given by executive budgeting uh, to put that sort of thing in a bill? Uh, I, um, you know, my, my initial impulse, I guess maybe everyone's initial impulse, maybe not, maybe not Jim McGuire's, but almost everyone's initial impulse, is to say no, that's going too far, that's outrageous. Indeed, I have no problem with the idea that it's outrageous. Whether it's constitutional is a different question. Uh, and there are a not quite a number, it's, it's, it's a kind of problem that has recurred again and again in our state and I guess elsewhere, in which the, um, uh, uh, a, a very questionable practice has been adopted and you really wonder whether if the courts get involved, aren't they gonna just make it worse? Is it, does it really make any sense for courts to try to referee uh, a power struggle between the legislature and the governor when maybe one or the other has overstepped its bounds? Uh, should we go on the opinion that the governor and the legislature are both uh, 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 big boys and girls who can, t who, who, who can handle uh, their problems for themselves? Uh, do we say, and w uh, is the question just a political question that the courts will never decide? Well, we don't know yet, but maybe sometime we'll find out. I hate to disappoint Bob, but um, I do think that some of the hypotheticals he posed uh, would represent a pretty outrageous exercise of the governor's law authoring power under Article 7. Um, but I think the answer to it is that the check on that is political, and it's not constitutional. Um, but more on that later if there's questions. Um, I'd like to uh, say too, the response to something else that came up, uh, was, the question was, does the Constitution allow the governor by use of policy language to countermand statutes? I think uh, Professor uh, Gail posed that uh, question. My answer to that question is yes, in a very significant sense. It does in the sense that the governor can temporarily suspend the operation of statutes that are inconsistent with the choices the governor makes with respect to how money should be spent in a particular year. And I don't think there's anything controversial about that. I don't see why a governor should be imprisoned by statutes that were enacted by prior governors um, and should be forced to have those spending terms dictated to him by, by, by prior governors. Um, but in any event, uh, 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 I think it can, be, it can be, the governor's authority under Article 7 after Silver versus Pataki can be easily overstated. And so I'm just going to pose a question. I'm not going to try to answer it now. But I think it's something that people should think about. And that is, you know, many states have legislative budgeting where the governor has line item veto authority. So, the question that you should, I think people should ask is, to what extent does the New York governor under, after Silver versus Pataki, have any more authority over the budget making process than a governor in a line item veto state with legislative budgeting, who can by, have enough political support in one house of the legislature to prevent an override? I submit they're in essentially the same position. And it's not nearly as revolutionary as people uh, make it out to be. But in any event, let me go, go to, back to the subject that I did want to talk brief, about briefly. The whole point of what we know about, uh, as Article 7 was to transfer a portion of the legislative power from the legislature to the governor. I'm not going to go into why uh, that's been covered before. Presumably many of you know that. Um, 
but the text indisputably makes cl clear that that's exactly what, they, what the framers did. The governor is obligated, after all, under Section 3 to submit appropriation bills. He's kind of a super legislator. No legislator has, has the right to uh, introduce a bill, uh, have, have its introduction guaranteed. But something more was needed, something more than Section 3, uh, and, and that, uh, to make that, to effectuate that transfer. And uh, after all, if the legislature could do whatever it wanted with the items of appropriation submitted by the governor, then the, then the uh, transfer power would be purely formal, it would be nominal, it would exist at the sufferance of the legislature. So Section 4 and its no alteration clause is the critical um, uh, second step. It secures the transfer uh, of, of, the, of that power and to the uh, transfer of legislative power to the governor. So what was at stake in Silver versus Pataki was whether executive budgeting would survive. Uh, that's because the issue, when all is said and done in that case, was whether Section 4 me means what it says. And it says that the legislature cannot alter the items of appropriation submitted by the governor except in the specified ways, by reducing them, by striking them out, which is really a form of a veto power. That's the reversal of the roles that we see. The, now, the, now the legislature has the veto power and uh, has the power to add items of appropriations provided they're stated separately and distinctly. So, um, uh, if the, you know, if, if the question there was, there was, does it mean what it say? If the legislature, can legislature do indirectly what it can't do directly? Bankers and others cases had made clear that cannot alter the items of appropriation themselves, so the legislature had various devices which it used single purpose appropriation bills, amending the governor's uh, items of appropriation and other bills. Um, and uh, if, that was, if that was permissible, as Judge Smith wrote, quote, executive budgeting would no longer exist. Uh, and he was quite right. It was a, th uh, a, a threat to executive budgeting. It would not have existed had the decision come out differently. And from my perspective, bravo to uh, Judge Smith and to Judge Raffio and to Judge Reed and also to the two concurring judges, judges um, uh, 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 Rosenblatt and, and uh, George Bundy Smith. Silver versus Pataki is enormously important for <coughs> these two reasons. One, it did preserve executive budgeting, and second, it greatly enhanced the governor's negotiating leverage with the legislature. And I certainly agree with, uh, with Judge Smith. I mean, that's, 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 that's what it does. Uh, and it does give the power to the governor uh, to, uh, to, in negotiations, insist on policy changes in matters unrelated to the budget as a condition for spending money the legislature the way the legislature wants, but I don't think that's at all controversial or, or really it's something we should worry about. Um, but it, it enhanced the governor's power because the legislature had long maintained that, the gov that, the, that it could alter the governor's items of appropriations and governors had long been uncertain about whether the legislature could alter its, uh, the governor's items of appropriations. So that issue was settled by, by the case. I think Silver versus Pataki became inevitable in 1984, I guess it was, when the bankers' case was decided, which ruled, uh, and it was not an interbench uh, fight, but it, it was the case that ruled that uh, the legislature could not, even with the consent of the governor, add uh, language to an item of appropriation. I want to turn briefly to the issue raised, discussed, and resolved by the concurrence authored by George, Judge Rosenblatt and joined by George, uh, Judge Smith, uh, uh, the other Judge Smith. And that issue is whether there are any limitations on the governor's authority to author items of appropriation other than the limitation set forth in Section 6, which as many of you know is the anti-rider clause, the provision that prevents the legislature and the governor from including in multi-purpose appropriation bills uh, provisions that, um, uh, that are wholly unrelated to spending. Uh, the concurrence uh, would have ruled that there are su such limitations. And one thing to note here is that resolving this question was not necessary to the resolution of the case. And it's pretty hard to square the concurrence uh, in that respect with the uh, the prohibition on, on advisory opinions, and it's also, I think, of note that uh, the parties didn't ask uh, for the guidance of the court on this issue, and it really wasn't um, uh, meaningfully briefed. But 
the, the concurrence would have adopted a balancing test for determining what the governor cannot include in his or her items of appropriation. Um, and uh, the test, uh, according to the concurrence, is designed to, quote, protect the legislature's lawmaking preeminence, end quote. And I think that's perplexing because the whole point of Article 7 was to end that preeminence. It was to effectuate a balance of powers between the two branches so that neither branch could spend money without the concurrence of the other branch. Not only couldn't spend it, but, but had to agree on the terms and conditions of it. So it's an equipoise, it's a balance. But anyway, here's what the concurrence's balancing test is. Quote, to begin with, nothing that is more than incidentally legislative should not appear in an appropriation bill. The factors we consider in deciding whether an appropriation is impermissibly legislative include the effect on substantive law, the durational impact of the provision, and the history and custom of the budgeting, pro budgeting prospect, uh, process." End quote. I'm just going to have a, a couple of short responses to that. Uh, I, I think, um, as Judge Robert Smith uh, noted in his plurality opinion, which was agnostic on this question, that, that if there are the kind of limitations, if those kind of limitations were to be recognized, we might have the very worst. I think we would have the worst, not legislative budgeting, not executive budgeting, but judicial budgeting. And we would have that because of the complete open texture of this text. What does it mean to say, to try to determine whether something is incidentally uh, legislative? When is a provision too policy laden? Judges are only going to be able to make hopelessly ad hoc decisions on that subject. Um, I also think it's inconsistent with basic precepts of constitutional interpretation because we have uh, a, a carefully crafted article where with, uh, that was, that was uh, drafted by some extraordinarily eminent legal scholars and thinkers in New York, uh, and it kind of basically suggests that they didn't know what they were about when they didn't add any other conditions or any limitations on the governor's authority. And um, finally, I'll say, and since I'm running out of time, uh, I would say that to recognize um, uh, those limitations would have the kind of perverse effect of giving New York's governor, an executive budgeting uh, state, less power than governors in legislative budgeting <coughs> states who have line on veto authority. Thank you, and I hope we have time for some questions. This panel is entitled The Players, um, but I'm really not a player. My two uh, venerable uh, panelists were players because uh, <laughs> Judge Smith, of course, was in the conference at the Court of Appeals when Silva v. Pataki was decided. And, of course, Judge McGuire um, <coughs> was up in Governor Pataki's office uh, creating uh, their argument, their structure about uh, the governor's uh, powers, apparently nearly all-powerful uh, powers. Um, but right off the, right off the bat, um, an easy case, judge. It was 3-2-2. Two, two. And on the actually essential and long-range question as to whether or not there are limits on the governor's executive budget problem, you'd lost four to three. You lost because there were two votes in the concurrence which said certainly there were limitations. And then there were another two votes in the dissent that said there were limitations. Now, Judge Earl, a hell of a lot smarter than me and maybe than your other colleagues. But on that particular issue, um, you lost. Uh, with regard to uh, Judge McGuire's position, he didn't get one vote on the court. He also may be a heck of a lot smarter than me and the judges on the court, but not one judge on the court explicitly adopted your position, uh, Judge McGuire. That is that, uh, in short, that with regard to Article 7, what was intended was that the entire legislative power was transferred to the executive as long as the executive could relate that power 
to some spending matter. Well, you could do that with just about anything. That's not a limitation whatsoever. But looking at the, again, at the vote count, what we had was we did have five to two with regard to those specific items at issue. That's Judge Smith's uh, three-member plurality and then the two-member concurring opinion of Judge Rosenblatt. And then we had the two in dissent, Judge Kay and Judge Saparic. Again, we had four to three saying that there actually are limits on what the governor can put in an appropriation bill. Um, those four votes, again, were Rosenblatt, the two in concurrence, Judge Kay, the two in dissent, and then the three, the losing side was, well, it really wasn't a losing side because uh, Judge Smith really declined to define whether or not there might be a limitation. Uh, I want to talk about what might be the elephant in the room, and that's the composition of the court at the time. Uh, the plurality opinion was written by three recently appointed Pataki judges, which is not at all to suggest, not at all to suggest, that they voted the way they did because they wanted to pay back Governor Pataki. Please, I'm not saying that. What I am saying, however, is that judges are human, just like the rest of us. And when cases are close, you see, I actually think the case is close. I think this is a difficult case. And when cases are close, cases are difficult, you know, perhaps sympathies with, um, friendly relations with, um, overall generally shared philosophies with a governor just might nudge you to one particular side. The dissent, of course, Judge Kay, Chief Judge Kay, and Judge Saparic were anything but warm with regard to Governor Pataki because he had just recently blasted them in their voting and the court's leanings to the so-called left. So they didn't particularly sympathize with Governor Pataki's powers. With regard to the two concurring judges, one was a Pataki appointee, one was a Mario Cuomo appointee, Rosenblatt, the Pataki appointed, appointee, did not have a record of consistently voting with other Republican appointees on the court, much to the ire of Governor Pataki in some cases, such as the death penalty case. Uh, Governor George Bundy Smith, he also wasn't particularly consistent with voting with the Republican Cuomo appointees. So there you get the concurring opinion. And again, I hope nobody takes me to say that they were just simply paying back governors that they liked or didn't like. It's not that, it's that nudge that every single one of us feels. The significance of for the future. We see the Court of Appeals being remade. We see that court being remade. And when another case does get to the Court of Appeals, to understand the decision, you can't completely disregard who's on the court and what their relations are with the governor. We saw that in Skelos versus Patterson, right? We did see that in Skelos versus Patterson, where you did have uh, the more liberal Democratic judges voting in favor of the liberal Democratic governor. You had the more conservative Republican judges against him. And somehow the liberals were able to snag um, Judge Susan Reed onto their side. Coincidental? What are the odds that all these things are coincidental? Come on. Uh, let's get back to the decision. With regard to the plurality, uh, Judge Smith repeatedly, repeatedly, and Judge Smith, you do this in lots of opinions, you can't draw a meaningful line. There's no clear meaningful line. There's no clear meaningful line about it virtually anything in life or the law, certainly not the cases that get to the Court of Appeals. That's why they get there. Most of the cases that get to the New York Court of Appeals get there because they're pretty darn tough. So of course there's not gonna be a very, very clear line. Uh, a false distinction between budget making and policy making? I think it's a false identity to say these things are the same. Of course they overlap. Day overlaps into night. Uh, life overlaps into death. And virtually every case at the Court of Appeals, there are arguments on both sides that lap into one another. And you know, the judges are there to make a decision. 
to balance and to draw a line. That's what they do. That's what they do. And they could have done it in um, Pataki versus Silver. Uh, the dissent, the actual dissent by Chief Judge Kaye did draw a pretty clear line. That doesn't necessarily mean that we, we agree with that line, but she thought it was pretty clear the difference between budget making and legislation. Again, doesn't necessarily mean we or even I agree with that, but thought that that was a line that could be drawn. The concurrence, the concurrence did what lots of judges do, lots of really good judges like Felix Frankfurter and Lewis Powell and so many others. The concurrence by Judge Rosenblatt understood that perhaps there can't be such a bright, clear line in every single case and therefore let's consider a bunch of factors and we weigh those factors. My word, that's what judges do in most cases, whether they want to admit it or not. They usually write these opinions as though their side is certain, but we know that's not true. We know that's not true. There are difficulties in these cases, and what judges do, whether they're explicit about it or not, is that they balance the factors, they balance the interests. The problems with the approaches, the different approaches, the plurality, Again, everything Judge Smith said in the plurality may be right. He might be, but the problem is there's just no guidance for the future. There's no guidance for the future. The dissent, I think Judge Smith was right with regard to the dissent. It can't be that everything that's legislating, everything that's legislative law making is inappropriate, is unconstitutional for the governor to include in an appropriation bill. Because too many appropriation bills, too many spending matters, have an intimate connection to policy making. Sometimes it is impossible to separate those two. With regard to the concurrence, of course the weakness with the concurrence, as with the weakness of any decision, or any opinion that balances factors, is that there's nothing hard, clear, and fast that can very easily be applied. Again, that's why we have judges. We know what the problems are with clear, bright lines that are drawn. We've seen that, for example, let's take, for example, another much lesser court, the United States Supreme Court. Have you ever decided <laughs> to figure out their search and seizure jurisprudence? They've got nice, clear, bright lines. It doesn't matter to them, for example, what the offense is. Ooh, a seatbelt violation, bright line. You can be arrested, even though it's just a seatbelt violation. Oh, because you were arrested just for a seatbelt violation, you can be searched. Oh, because of the bright line, seatbelt violation, the interior of your car could be searched. Oh, because you were arrested for a seatbelt violation, you could be taken down to the station for processing. Oh, and if during the processing you're placed in a cell with some other inmates, you can be strip searched. Those are the kinds of moronic rulings you get when you stick to a rigid, bright line. Thank God the Court of Appeals in Silva versus Pataki did not adopt any such bright line. What ultimately is going to happen is that there will be another case. Some of it will depend on the composition of the case of the uh, court and the sympathies those members have with the governor. But a lot more is going to depend, and whether they admit it or not, it's going to depend on the balancing of factors. And all I have to say is thank God for that. And thank you very much. <laughs>
the side of the coin that deals with the legislature, the court in Silver versus Pataki, as it had done in five other cases over 80 years, squarely said no to the legislature. As I understand it, with respect to the governor, you were satisfied that the appropriation bills passed muster. Then there was the unanswered question. I wouldn't do this to you if this were a Senate confirmation hearing or if you were a sitting judge, but I can't resist. It's been a dozen years since Silver versus Pataki. You've seen a lot of Albany come and go during that period. You've seen how subsequent governors have used that authority. Are there any thoughts you would share with us about how you might come down on that issue today? Uh, your question is how, how would I decide the issue we didn't decide? Bingo. <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder about I want Look, uh, if I, I wondered about it then, I wonder about it now. And I, I honest to God, don't know. Uh, it would, um, uh, I think, very little of what Professor Bonventry said was right, but he's undoubtedly right. <laughs> He's, he's undoubtedly right in, yeah, uh, in, uh, in saying that, the, uh, that you do have to make a judgment on particular cases. And I, I would want to know what exactly the governor had done. I guess I want, uh, yeah, before, you, before I answer how far am I going to let a governor go, you got to tell me how far a governor has the guts to go. So far, they haven't gone for they haven't gone that far. With all, after all that fumfering, and I don't know, and I'm not sure. I think I probably come down Jim McGuire's way. I come down that it's a political question, not a question for the courts. Well, then, so let me ask Judge McGuire. Uh, one would argue, some could argue, what sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. 80 years, six decisions. Remain one, two, Saxton v. Carey, the banker's case, Silver versus Pataki. Time and time again, the Court of Appeals has said no to the legislature and jealously guarded the prerogatives of the governor. In a case where, let's just stipulate, that a governor has gone too far, gone beyond what anyone would defend is a appropriation bill that has anything to do with matters fiscal. Let's just say notwithstands the whole penal law for a category of state employees. Given that track record, 80 years of the Court of Appeals protecting the governor's prerogatives, is there no role for the court to protect the legislature's prerogatives? Well, your, your hypothetical is, is, I mean, you could maybe, I'm sure you could come up with a different one, Hank, but that one doesn't really fly because that would flunk the anti-rider test of Article 7, Section 6. Um, but uh, my, my answer is the, the one I gave before, which is provided that an item of appropriation does not flunk the anti-rider clause, there are no justiciably, justiciably cognizable limits, and there are political questions, there are political uh, consequences. And that's consistent with the whole purpose of Article 7, which is to concentrate power and accountability in the same individual. This power to author items of appropriation, we can come up with these parade of horribles arguments where, oh, the governor could do this terrible thing, could do that terrible thing. Well, the legislature could do it under legislative budgeting. The power can, of course, be abused. The question is, are we better off vesting it in the legislature or the governor? I think the answer is clear, and, that it's, and that's certainly the framers did, and that's why so many decisions have gone the governor's way because the language is so clear. But the, the legislature, we have a history where they did abuse it. And that's why we got Article 7, because there was a history of profligacy by the legislature. It exists in a fundamental way to spend money. You can't spend $5 in Suffolk County without legislators in other districts clamoring to spend the same $5 in other districts. Uh, Can I just chime in? Please. I'm going to shock uh, Judge uh, McGuire. I absolutely agree with what he just said. Uh, it's actually much, much better that we have... <laughs> You're going to change your position? Yeah, okay. Uh, it, it obviously does seem to be much, much better that we have executive budgeting. And I agree with him about the penal law, that particular hypothetical. But, you know, there are others that are closer. And I think this is where you really have to make a decision. For example, the governor and his appropriation bill 
decides that certain amounts of money are going to be um, provided for a safe streets program. And attached to that, and related to that, is a new criminal law that he defined. Is the governor allowed to create a new criminal law? I think that's where the kinds of difficulties come in. That new criminal law, that new section of the penal code, right, certainly would be related to the safe streets. It wouldn't take somebody like uh, Judge McGuire to figure out a very, very close, if not intimate, relationship. Can the governor do that? Can he actually create criminal laws? I think that's where the issue becomes difficult. I also happen to agree with Judge Smith on this. I was being cute before, but with regard to those two items that were before Judge Smith, I would have voted with Judge Smith as well in terms of those, those two items. Those two items. I probably would have gone along with Judge Rosenblatt with regard to the factors, but I think those two items were um, clearly within the governor's uh, budgeting power. Yeah, anyway. Uh, just a comment, which is, and this is, I hear this all the time. Um, the professor said, you know, can the governor create penal law provisions? It, you know, that's wrong from the starting gate. All the governor can do is propose. He can create nothing. He proposes and the legislature has to agree. Could the governor say, I'm gonna have a new spending program and we're gonna, a, 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 a program that's gonna design to reduce I income disparities, and we're gonna have transfer payments to, to help less fortunate people. But, in that appro a condition of the appropriation is, if you're caught stealing, you get, it's a new offense, and, and sure, I think the governor could. It would lapse at the end of two years, but of course, of course I think the governor could, could clearly do that. One more point on this, you know, balancing tests. Judges love balancing tests, a lot of them do. What balancing tests do? They give judges more power. And here, to, judge, to, to adopt the proposed test that Judge Rosenblatt would have had, and there's no four votes on what that test is, to adopt that would result in hopelessly ad hoc decisions from the court. <coughs> it's a very familiar concept, the judiciability doctrine, that some questions just do not lend themselves to, to judicial decision making, precisely because there's no standards. And I think it's folly to think that Judge Rosenblatt's proposed test is anything other than a classic case of a, of, of a, a balancing test that would, it, it would, that would embarrass the court because it would enmesh it in political disputes and it would not provide no basis for any principal decision making. Well, Judge McGuire, just to follow up, uh, Professor Bonaventure sort of made the point there were four judges on the Silver versus Pataki court that indicated that the governor could do, go too far and that that was a justiciable issue. And yet, thankfully, a dozen years have come and gone and the issue has not been litigated. So the danger that Judge Smith suggested of judicial budgeting has not come to pass. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Well, I mean, it, it could if a governor pushed it uh, too far, but uh, you know, again, there, there, is, there are no four votes on what the test is, and there's certainly no holding from the court that there, that there, is, that there are, the, are limitations on them, let alone what, what they are. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 obviously it could happen, and it will depend on the composition of the court uh, at the time. Um, and. Um, yeah, m my vote, my view didn't get one vote, as the good professor points out. <laughs> but, but what that, what that doesn't, what that, what that doesn't uh, mean you're wrong. Mean, that, what, well, it more than that, it wasn't. Decided. The question wasn't even presented. It wasn't even up before the court. So to say my view didn't get one vote is completely meaningless. <laughs> this was wasn't even briefed by the parties. This was the plurality was responding to this sua sponte discussion of this issue raised by Judge Rosenblatt and joined by George, Judge uh, G.B. Smith. Uh, professor, uh, you talked a little bit about the change in the composition of the Silver versus Pataki Court to today where I think only one of the seven judges that were on the bench in 2004 still sit on the court. Over the course of that dozen years, has the court in the separation of powers area handed down any decisions we could read the tea leaves on in terms of how they might do issues like this? This particular composition? No, I mean, this particular composition is just far too new. Far too new. 
Um, but you know, we're going to get another. We're going to get another case. We're actually going to get another case. And despite what Judge McGuire says, you can't possibly determine whether or not the governor went too far in Silver versus Pataki unless you had some standard. Unless you had some. I didn't say anything to the contrary. Oh, thank you. Well, if, if the audience could indulge me, um, these folks are going to be coming back for our very last panel. So if you could hold some of your questions, you will certainly have an opportunity to speak to this extraordinary group of presenters. Thank you for that. Thank you.